My favorite part of one of Kristen Crow's books, such a hard decision to pick a book that I wanted to share because I love all of them, but I chose Bedtime at the Swamp. And I chose Bedtime at the Swamp because it just makes me laugh. Um, they're just so afraid of the monster and then there's a little surprise later. So I'm going to share some of my favorite parts of Bedtime at the Swamp that really gave me a good chuckle. I love this beginning part because um, the picture just looks so scary. It's really fun to read. I heard splish, splash, room ba room ba bim bam boom. Splish, splash, room ba room ba bim bam boom. Well, my hands were shaken and my heartbeat raced as I leapt through the marshes and a monster chased. When it followed behind me in the sludgy slime, it was rocking and swaying the entire time. That just really caught my attention because the monster looks so scary. It went splish, splash, room ba room ba bim bam boom. Splish, splash, room ba room ba bim bam boom. I love the rhyme and rhythm in Kristen's books also. So we're going to skip ahead just a little bit, although I even love this part where the boy and the dog are in the tree. It's so cute. And we're going to go to a part that I thought um, was kind of funny. And I liked this part was kind of funny, the way the monster just looks so afraid. And out sprang the monster that had made us scared with its big feet a stomping and its sharp teeth bared. I yelled, help! It's the creature from the Black Lagoon. But just when we thought we faced certain doom, I guess on the last page I meant to say the monster looks scary, but look on this page, he just looks so scared. We heard splish, splash, roomba, roomba, bim, bam, boom. Splish, splash, Roomba Roomba Bim Bam Boom. And my favorite part is this part. I think it's such a surprise. Then out of the darkness stumped my dear old ma. She burst through the cattails and she cried, Aha, I've been trying to get you children home to bed and I find you a hiding in the tree instead. So that part I find really funny, and I also like when they're all coming out of the tree. Such a great and fun book, and I really love sharing my favorite part with you. My favorite part. With a sigh of relief, Celie crawled back into the tunnel. She went quickly, feeling very light now, that she had no responsibilities to anyone other than herself. All the staff were gone, her brother and sister were out, and the castle might be brought back to life one day. She eagerly slid open the stone door at the end of the tunnel and burst into her parents' bedchamber, where Prince Kelsch was not, in fact, jumping on the bed. He was placing the crown on his head while the emissary watched. Put that down! Celie grabbed a cold torch from the sconce by her head and threw it at Prince Kelsch, who dropped the crown in surprise. It clanged on the stone floor and rolled toward her. Celie tripped trying to leap out of the tunnel and snatch it and landed hard at the emissary's feet. She managed to get the crown anyway and wiggled across the floor with it clutched to her chest. The emissary fell over her, bruising her ribs, but she could only let her breath out in an oomph. And then she had to move. She scrambled to her feet and out the door of the bedchamber with Kelsch right behind her. There was a single guard waiting outside, but he was too startled to follow for a moment. Soon enough, though, Celie could hear him pounding after her and the emissary, too, making three heavy sets of footsteps she had to escape. She ran straight into the main hall without thinking and saw that there was no guard at the front doors. They probably didn't think that anyone would try to walk out the front doors of the castle under the eyes of anyone coming or going through the throne room. Of course, there was also the enormous bar carved from a 200-year-old oak that had been lowered into its brackets to keep the door securely closed. 
Basili knew the castle better than anyone. As she passed the bust of King Glower the first, she slapped the back of his majesty's head with one hand. The bust and the pedestal it stood on rocked forward and then stopped in mid-fall, revealing a mechanism beneath the edge of the pedestal. The mechanism triggered machinery in the floor that raised the bar across the doors. Tucking the crown under one arm, Seely hit the right side of the door with her shoulder and it swung open on well-greased hinges, hardly checking her flight as she raced out into the sunlight of the courtyard. There were more vervish soldiers there and the portcullis was down, the drawbridge up. If she could make it to the stables, she could take one of the tunnels under the moat or the barracks. She'd gotten so many maids and laundresses out safely, she couldn't believe that she would have difficulty getting away. Seize her, the emissary screamed, and the men in the courtyard all drew their weapons. All at once, there were too many armed men between her and the stables, which were next to the barracks. She changed direction and ran for the nearest stairs. They only led to the guard tower and the walkway along the top of the wall, but it would buy her time. She could hear Kelsch breathe, labored breathing behind her, and she knew that the stairs would slow him down. She took them two at a time, thinking her good fortune that her gown and narrow skirts was a good inch too short. She tucked the crown into her front of her sash and hiked up her skirts up high all the same. When she reached the top of the stairs, the guard was peering out of the nearest tower, so she whipped around and ran along the top of the wall in the direction of the balcony. And then I'll skip a little bit. She heard the roar of voices, several of them calling her name, coming from outside the castle. She looked down to the army, camped on the other side of the moat. She was directly across from the largest tent, the one bearing the flag of slain. There was a lot, knot of people standing in front of the tent, staring up at her with white faces. She recognized the wet black gown and long dripping hair of her sister. She decided that the crown took precedence. Lila, she pulled it out of her sash. I've got the crown. Seely, she froze. Daddy? I'm going to read you my favorite part of the Rose Legacy. It's when Athea was learning how to ride Bluebell for the first time. Before she could ask, Uncle Andrew arranged the reins on the horse's neck and then laced his fingers together, holding out his cupped palms to her. Put your knee in, he said. Beg pardon? Your knee, the left one. Put it in my hands and I'll boost you up. Athea hesitated. She'd seen some of the men mounting their horses from her window, but they usually just gave a jump and sort of a swing and were up. She'd seen Jillian in the saddle too, but never noticed how she got there. How could her uncle holding her knee get her in the saddle? Bluebell shifted and sighed, and Athea caught a thought from her. Something about hay and feeling of boredom. She was boring the horse? Bad enough that Athea had her uncle and the rest of the brigade to judge her, but the horses as well? That was too much. She put her knee into her uncle's Andrew's cupped hands and he heaved her into the air. She screeched and leaped backwards out of his hands, barely managing to land on her feet. Sorry, should have explained more, her uncle said, giving Bluebell a comforting rub around the neck. Now, grab a hold of the pommel in your left hand. That's the front of the saddle. Good, now hold the cr cantle. That's the back, with your right. When I lift, move your right hand and swing your leg over. Oh, I see, she said nodding sagely even though she didn't understand any of it let's try it again he cupped her hands and she put her knee into them grabbing the saddle at the same time her uncle heaved she pulled the horse she pulled the horse's ears went back and she was suddenly hanging from the saddle with her legs held stiffly above the ground by her uncle pull yourself up he grunted raising her a little more i'm trying the next thing Athea knew, her uncle had both his hands under her buttocks and was shoving her into the saddle. She pulled herself up as hard as she could, kicking her feet like a swimmer until she was lying across Bluebell's back. Then Uncle Andrew took a hold of her right leg and threw it up and over the horse's rump. She was sitting upright. I like that part because it explains how some people who have never been on a horse don't know how to ride a horse. Hi boys and girls. I'm here to tell you why I like this book called Hello Hippo Goodbye Bird and it's by one of my favorite authors, Kristen Crow. 
This book is really good because sometimes we don't realize when we need a good friend around. And Hippo doesn't think he needs any friends. I'm going to share a couple pages of the pages I like that kind of tells you a little bit about the story. It says, hello, Hippo. And Hippo says, go away. This is where I think it's really funny. It says, but you need a bird like me. I'm a great hat. See, and he's up there as a hat. And Hippo goes, Rump. Then he says, or check this out. I'm a hippopotamus mustache. And he says, he's a mustache right now. The hippo's mustache. And he goes, Rump. I also tell jokes. Want to hear one? And you can see right here, the hippo is not amused at all. And this part right here, this is the part I like. And it's when all the bugs come for him. They go, and he goes, ack, patooey. Well, 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 hello, hippo. Because the bird sees he's in trouble. And he goes, ack, ack, patooey, help. And guess what? The bird comes in and eats all of the bugs and gets them away from the hippo. Now the hippo realizes he needs a good friend like the bird. Cute book, huh? Well, thanks. You guys ought to check this book out. It's a great book. Hello, hippo. Goodbye, bird. Bye, guys. Bad news. Anthea breathed on the cold window, fogging the glass, and wrote her name on the misty pane. Anthea Geneva Thornley. Jean, the upstairs maid, would have a devil of a time getting rid of the streaks, but Anthea didn't care. Maybe Jean wouldn't notice, and ever after, when the window fogged, Anthea's name would reappear. Anthea had known it would be only a matter of time before she was shunted off to another set of relatives. Nobody wanted her for very long, although they were all very polite about it. It would not have occurred to them not to be, any more than it would have occurred to them to refuse to take her in, and it wasn't as though they, she were a financial burden. Her parents had left her a substantial inheritance. Somehow, though, she always seemed to be in the way. What a great hook. What is it? Celie could barely whisper, pressing her eyes so hard to the spy glass that it hurt. What's happening? His sleep, Lila was giggling. Can you see under the arm? Celie peered around, moving her spy glass in a little circle, until at last the prince's sleeve came into view. The seam of Kalsh's black robe had split right under the arm. It was hard to spot because Kalsh wore a dark plum colored tunic underneath, but it was there. The sensation of his robe tearing had frozen Kelsch for a moment. Then he hastily lowered his arm, clapping it tight to his side and looking around to see if anyone else had noticed. No one had, but the best of the rest of the council did give Prince Kelsch some very perplexed looks as he stopped speaking mid-sentence and turned to glare at Rolf. Rolf went back guilelessly, while Celie silently begged him not to laugh or say anything witty, lest Kelsch realized that Rolf had something to do with it. Look at Lord Fiend, Lila cried. Oh, just look, Celie. The elderly lord had at last consented to sit, which was probably a mistake on his part. For when he sank down into the straight back chair, his rope pulled tight at the shoulders, and the seams promptly parted. Now his rope was sliding down his chest and back, exposing his rusty black tunic and trapping his arms as he squawked and flapped about like a surprised cow. Celie couldn't stop giggling, and neither could Lila. As the emissary leaned forward, Lord Fiend, to help him gather up the pieces of his robe, his own robe split under the arms as well. Celie let out a cheer, and Lila snorted in a most unladylike fashion. She was laughing so hard. In the meantime, Rolf continued to sit on his chair. Only now he assumed an expression of great concern. He watched the council cluck and fuss for a little while longer, manfully hiding his amusement as three more lords fell victim to their prank, until the footman came back with the papers from his room. Rolf said something that looked as though he was excusing himself from the mess. He stood up and nodded regally around at the discomfited lords, his royal air only ruined by the fact that he appeared to be whistling as he strolled out of the throne room. Stop, Prince Kelch, 
Kelsch bellowed. Seely could read the word on his thick lips, but Rolf didn't look back. Hurrah! Seely spun away from the spyglass, laughing. Rolf did it! She had not realized until that moment how nervous she was about Rolf having to sign the succession papers. But she had a deep hidden terror that once he did, Kelsch would plan to have him killed immediately. She could see that Lila felt the same way, for her sister was visibly shaking as she turned away from her own spyglass and groped her way to the table and stool. Hi everyone, I am going to read this book called Middle Child Blues. It's one of my very favorite Kristen Crow books. I really like it because I'm a middle child too, so sometimes I get the middle child blues. Well, first there was Raymond, uh-huh. Then there came Lee, that's me. Kate, she was next, so that made three. Do you see the picture of the three of them? Ray, the admired son, uh-huh. Kate is the cute one. Oh yeah, but me, I'm in between. Hardly noticed, hardly seen. He's sad right there. Nobody notices him. I'm too big for Kate's playmates. Ray's friend yells, beat it, go. But when my pals come over, Kate and Raymond still the show. Why does Ray stay up later? Shouldn't Kate have chores too? My parents say he's older and she's younger than you. Those chores, they're the worst. I've got the middle child blues. I feel forgotten and confused. That's right, middle child, child blues. And I'm really not amused. He is not amused about those middle child blues. I've got the low down big frown soaking all around, bummed out to mid kid blues. He's sad sitting in the back of the car in the middle. Ray can order a big bun and Kate's mill has a toy. I get a plain cheeseburger since I'm just the middle boy. Gosh, I feel bad for him, don't you? I can't ride with the babies or drive go-karts with Ray. You're too big. You're too little, is all my parents say. I'm not the shortest, no way. I'm not the tallest, oh no. I'm not the biggest and I'm not the smallest. It's hard when you don't get to be one of those things, huh? I'm not the last, no way. I'm not the first, oh no. I'm not the best and I'm not the worst. I'm not the shiny engine or the little red caboose. I'm just a boring box car. So I wonder what's the use. I've got the middle child blues. It is a curse I didn't choose. That's right, the middle child blues. Down to my middle child shoes. I've got the low down big frown, soaking all around, bummed out mid kid blues. So I'll get out my guitar. I'll play the blues right here for you. Look, I'm drawing a big, big crowd. They say we're middle children too. <gasps> He's not alone. He's not the only middle child. And now there's four TV crews and they put me on the news singing the middle child blues. I'm the kid like no other, yeah, yeah. Not just Ray and Kate's brother, no, no. I'm Lee and I'm blue, wish my folks had a clue. Woohoo, woohoo, woohoo. I'm not as good a singer as Ray, or as Lee is. Not as good a singer as Lee at all. 
Then mom and dad joined the show. We're middle children, you know. We just forgot for a while. I pluck my guitar and I smile. We sing the middle child blues and I'm really quite amused. We sing the low down, slow down, show down, shaking up the whole town, big time mid kid blues. Look at that, the mom and dad's even singing. Dad says, wow, that was great, but it's getting rather late. I take a bow right on beat. The applause is pretty sweet. And then I strut like a star to the middle of my car. And do the middle child snooze. Oh yeah. Isn't that a fun book about middle child blues and how it helped him to become an awesome singer with a band? I hope you enjoyed this story. And um, I know all of our classrooms have more books by Kristen Crow, so check it out.